Welcome to Windows on the World, bringing you cutting edge news, empowering information and no conspiracy theories. On tonight's show. Stephen and Evan Strong are authors and researchers based in Australia. They are regular guests on Windows on the World. And they believe that humans may have originated out of Australia over 400,000 years ago. Their books include Forgotten Origin, Constructing a New World Map, Mary Magdalene's Dreaming, Ancient Australia and Shunned. Stephen and Evan tonight join us from Australia. Stephen and Evan Strong, welcome back to Windows on the World. You've got some very interesting updates for us, haven't you? We certainly do. It's a pleasure to be back again. And uh, yes, we've got uh, two new um, uh, artifacts that have come in. One, as you, we just mentioned earlier, we haven't even sent you the article for, and it will be up later on today. And of course, another one that's come up since. And they're both, actually both belong to one site, don't they, Evan? Yes, they yeah, do. So it really enough. is interesting. It all sort of starting to run together. Great. So can you expand on that a bit? Roses Rock, Roses sure. Rock. Yeah, Number look, two, let's start with the second one. It's really an interesting story, Mark, because um, as you know, we've been working on the Mark Rock and we've done a lot of work with that. We've mentioned that before. Now, what actually happened, this second rock, and it's really an appalling story. We've got to be honest with that, haven't we, Evan? Yeah. Both, and also quite humorous, because what happened was that both um, Roz, the lady who found the first rock, and another person who's working with us, it's our camera person, both saw on eBay or something, they were auctioning off to the highest bidder anywhere in the world an incredibly sacred rock. Now, I've had people look at this and say this is just as important as the first one, and it's being sold to the highest bidder, which is a charming way to look after your most important archaeology in this country. Anyway, this lady rings me up, and she tells me something about this rock to begin with. She says it's amazing because on one side it's got engraved in it a massive letter A. Now, as you know, Mark, letter A is the first letter of our alphabet, but as people probably wouldn't know, nobody in Australia knew that the original people had an actual alphabet. Right? We've mentioned before they had a language, but not an alphabet. But actually they did, because we worked with um, Slater, who was the um, president of the Australian Archaeological Society, we worked with his notes, and he said the same thing. And he said the first letter was the letter A. Now here we are, and then we found out it was being sold and it had been found in a place very close to where the Standing Stone site was. So here could be evidence of the very first language and the very first letter ever written in the world anywhere, and it's on auction. And Roz rings me up about half an hour before, and she says mm. it's up to $28. Yeah, yeah. Something. And she thinks, yeah. I'm going to get this really cheap. Awesome. This is all going well, and we're going to get this very cheap. Unfortunately, the cameraman then found it on eBay, and he started bidding against Roz. Not knowing that they were bidding against no, each other. No, they bid it against each other, both so they could get the rock back to us. Anyway, hundreds and hundreds of dollars later, Ross finally bought it. So that's how the rock began. Now, the rock itself is amazing for a lot of different reasons. And the most important one is it's also made from exactly the same material as the first rock was. Sure, no different. In fact, when you put one next to the other and you put the less marked sides next to one another, it looks like bigger brother, littler sister. They are so identical to one another, but they were found over 800 kilometres apart. That's very interesting, Stephen. Uh, we featured that previous rock, which, just mm -hmm. to remind people, uh, was extremely hard and it had two kind of striations on it, two very different types of cuts, which made it very unique. And the main thing was that it appeared that this rock could only have really been engraved like this with some kind of machine tool. Just tell us a bit about the sort of rock that, this, that we're talking yep. about here. The first rock we spoke about, it's got three sides. It's got a, a, a set of markings on one side that looks like a map, and on the other side, it's got a lot more to it. But um, what is actually really interesting, and this is where it really opens it up, we are working with some of the top academics in this country. And one in particular is one of the best in the country, isn't he, Evan? Definitely. And he told us something. He said, but don't put my name next to this theory. We thought the same thing. And he said this himself. And then we said, oh, yes, we've got a proof, which we'll talk about. He said, okay, you chase that theory, but don't put my name on it. So it didn't come from him. Well, it did, but we can't say who he is. 
He thinks it's been cut, cut and fired by ceramics. The rock has been melted, fired down and melted, and then they've cut into it. Not chisel, but cut. And we've now done microscopic uh, photography by a professional photographer, and we found out exactly that. This rock, tens of thousands of years ago, which is the hardest sedimentary rock in the country, the way they marked it, according to the top, well, one of the top, well, we can't say what he is, can we? We might give it away. But this guy knows his stuff, and it was his idea first, and we believe it. We've got other proof. It was baked it was baked in. It was melted. Now, I want to know what machinery we had in, this, in on this planet. I don't care whether it's Australia or anywhere else. Tens of thousands of years ago, that could take one of the hardest rocks we've got and then turn it into liquid, then cut into it, and then ceramically fire it up. That was his idea, not ours. Right. That's absolutely fascinating. So it looks it as is. though you're drawing something together here because previously... It was alleged that somebody had found this rock in Africa, the cradle of civilization, and dropped it in Australia. Oh, yes, yes, yes. They came to the Australian Museum. Of course, they've since threatened us because we wrote that article, haven't they? They didn't like it. They didn't like They don't like us anymore, Mark. I'm sorry. They made personal contact on many occasions and said they're not happy with us. because we. And they said they were taken out of context. I love it when someone says they're taken out of context. Politicians love that phrase, and we know where that gets them. What's fascinating about this new rock, is not only that, mate, we've got something there that's also blown away our, our academics again and has got to the stage now, we've been told now by one academic, what they call is don't tell the strongs uh, climate in academia. He said it's now palpable. You don't even have to mention it. The problem with the second rock, really important, is we have something there which is called imprinting. Now, what this means is there are parts there with this mark there, and I'm looking at one now which is a semicircle which is 500 mil millimetres, a milli, milli, what is millimetres. it, milli what? Cent <laughs> oh, that's centimetres. That's the there to begin with. <laughs> yeah, half a centimetre across and half a centimetre deep. It's been stamped into the rock. Now, he said that you need 2,000 degrees centigrade to stamp in this because it didn't break the surface. We still have the same surface, but every other place where it's been cut, you see the cream underneath. With well, this one, it's brown on top, then it's stamped down, it's stamped down all that distance, and it's the same again. In other words, he said it has to be ceramic, or they need a rod, a poker, that is over 2,000 degrees Celsius. Now, 10,000 years ago, we don't know how we get around this one, but this second rock, what it also does is it proves that this is not just one freak occasion, but it's found throughout the whole of Australia. It breaks all the rules because the first rock we know is at least 10,000 years old, and this one, you're going to see it in the article, is quite amazing. This The second one, as you, it has actually got in it a place where there's a groove where your finger, your index finger rested on it. Now, I can hold it. I've got it in my hand now. I can take away my thumb and my three other fingers and wave the rock around, which I'm doing now, because it's meant to fit perfectly inside. But the beauty is when you take your finger away, the depression goes down about half a centimetre. It's been rubbed and rubbed and rubbed by skin for so long you can actually see the hole where the hole of the pad of your finger goes. You can feel it. My question is, how long has this rock, the hardest sedimentary in the country, been rubbed just by finger when it's been held to the stage where I'm looking at it now and the rubbing takes up the whole of one side of the rock. There's nothing there but just the impression of where the skin's been. This is so old. And this one has on one side about 400 pecs of four different diameters. And we think it's a star map. And then alongside that, we've got these lines, about six sets of lines, which are jagged. They've got dots and dashes like in Morse code. We're wondering, this is just a map of where our ancient ancestors came from. And we suspect it is. We don't know for sure, but as I said, there's at least 400 peck marks on one face. Each one has been done differently. They've done them for a reason. Mm. It just wasn't done because, oh, geez, I'm bored today. I'll, I'll get my rock out. I'll just carry it around. Yeah. I I'll, like the look of it. And I might ceramically fire it up 50,000 years ago and then scratch the marks in. No, this was all done. And we've actually shown this to quite a few people. And we're, both of these rocks we've been given, but I've got to make a point about both. We are giving them back to the elders. We've made this clear when it was given to us. We will pass it on. Because there's another part to this story that I think is really important, Mark. 
Both these rocks are made from silica, right? And on the, on the top, on the surface, we've got markings on all sides. On this new rock, I've got ancient marks that are incredibly straight and fine, and then the more recent marks are more coarse. It's like the more refined culture was older. But the important part of the story is they're both made from silica. They're obviously giving us a message. But here's a question for you. What are our computer chips made from? Silicon, the same as this rock. And I've said to the elders, and I've already asked this, and I've had an elder who's held it in his hand already. You were there, weren't you, Evan? Ah, uh, yes. And I said to him, is there a message inside? He said, of course there is. And I'm thinking the right elder with the right song or the right yadaki, which is a didgeridoo or a ball or the right instruments, can they unlock what's hidden inside these rocks? Because I believe there's two sets of messages. What's on the outside? Because the original people have a mantra in this country. And it goes like this. As on top, so below. I'm wondering, there's something below inside this rock that's part of that message too. We don't know. But between these two rocks, we have around about, around about seven to 800 different markings and insignias and infills and chisel marks and cut marks and all sorts of stuff made by beings, I'm not prepared to say what type, that would no, be, no, no. that's way <laughs> beyond it, made by beings, and I'm going to tell you now, no one on this planet is of the intelligence, and I know we've got Dr. Derek working on this, haven't we, Evan? Yeah. But he hasn't cracked it. I don't believe it. none of us can. Too smart for us. It's very interesting, this, because I did a show recently about the ancient energy grid, which... Mm -hmm. We talked about piezoelectricity in megaliths and the yeah. conductivity of the me megaliths. In other words, these cromlechs and dolmens may have been there for initiation purposes. Now, I, I was doing this interview with a lady called Charlie Fuchs, and I'll send you the video so you can have a look at it. Yeah. But I, there's also featured in the show was a guy called Freddie Silver, who you may know. He does a lot of yeah, talks yeah, yeah, and conferences. Yeah, he's a writer. But between the two of them, Charlie had done the yeah. testing uh, with voltmeters, and she found that the didgeridoo sound which she was using, because it contains partial frequencies and a drone, very yeah, similar to binaural beats and what were called perpetual choirs which was lots of people singing in, in unison, in harmony, for healing purposes and for spiritual purposes. So this may tie into a bigger picture. Is that where you're going with this? Definitely. Let me, let you, let, let me share a secret with you. The, the, the elder who I sh showed this rock to, the one in particular that comes from around here, um, who said straight away, he told me straight away, oh, didn't he? Oh, yeah, he I know said, oh, this has been fired, it's <laughs> ceramically fired. It's taken our professors and us about three months to come to that conclusion. He put it in his hand and he said, it come from this country here. It did. We hadn't told him a thing. Um, he is also, and this is very important, not only is he from country and the most of the old ways, he's the custodian of that way, and we will be giving this rock back to him. He doesn't even know that yet. He's also considered now either the second or the best didge player in the world, the didgeridoo player. He was taught by the master, and I've heard of his playing, and I've seen him play where he's brought a whole audience to tears. So when he plays that didge, next to the rock that he says, the, one, the small one we're talking about now, not the bigger one, but the small one just turned up, he already has a connection to this rock. When he plays with that didge, we might then get to hear that message that lays within and that when, when we first knew that, when I knew I knew it belonged to him, and that's why we actually we got, got out of the car and walked straight into him, didn't we, Evan? Yes. It wasn't coincidental. Yeah, that was And nice. we had the rock <laughs> with us. We'd just taken it somewhere to see a new site we're going to talk about next up, but not this time. And we took this rock along to show them the similarities because both these sites, this rock and the other one we'll talk about in the next piece we're doing, come from that site. So we had it with us. We got out of the car and walked straight into him. And I've been looking for him to give him this rock. So that wasn't coincidental. So the spirits want him to get that rock, and he will be giving it. When we're finished with this, we'll go back to him. But he has the ditch. It's called a yadaki in Australia. We don't call it the ditch. 
but it's called that mainstream, isn't it? Yeah. It's a didgeridoo. Yeah. He's the greatest player there is. Wait until he, he plays for that role. And that will happen. That will happen soon. Well, I think we're really onto something here, guys, and you, you, you two definitely are, as usual. We're going to take a short break, and we'll see you in a couple of minutes. Yep. Okay. No in your opinion, do you think the jury was led? It's not mine to say. <laughs> Very diplomatic. Tell the viewers a bit about what happened to you. Well, they bribed... Uh, three criminals to come in and give hearsay. If a bomb went off in London and took 92 lives, yeah, would you want to be on the payroll of that? It's um, all based on models and projections. It's all over barber shouting. In order to get me in prison, they probably broke, you know, a couple dozen laws. Free Yolanda. Y'all planted drugs on Yolanda, and we're going to get her released and get the crooked cops busted. That gave all the officers time for their adrenaline to, to slow down so we wouldn't get shot. Just for the viewers out there who may not know about this story, when did you discover this pyramid? In April of 2005, I first came to little Bosnian town of Visoko. When you drive someone to take their own life, like the CSA have done, I mean, that's an abomination. Thanks for being on Windows on the World. Peace to London. The rest is history. Everybody called me delirious after that. Stephen and Evan Strong, welcome back to Windows on the World. Hi, everyone. <laughs> it's great to have you back. And we've just joined up a few things here. I mean, you've been telling us about these new rocks that you found. And I just threw that in, this thing we've been doing, um, putting a, a, a bigger picture together on a show called The Ancient Energy Grid. But just pick up where you left off and what's, what kind of conclusions you're coming to drawing this thing together. Well, for me, as we were just mentioning before, I think we, we always look at the archaeology from both the point of view of the rock or the artifact and also from the spiritual aspect of this. This particular rock, I must share something with you. We, we've decided from now on when we take this on site, we can't let people hold it or I can't point at them because we'll have a problem. We've had people virtually collapse when it's been in their hands, so we're going to have to guard it from now on. Now, that's part of this story. And what, what we believe, and we'll just mention in the break there, that it's very important with sacred objects like this, there's a sound component to this. Now, the gentleman, the, the, the elder we're going to give this to, is one of the greatest ditch players in the world. Now, we know that when he plays that ditch to this rock, which belongs to him, there's a lot more. There's a lot more to this story that the ancients left behind. See, we also know that every site we've been onto is on a ley line. We know that. We, we, often we measure the damn thing. We've done it often, haven't we? Yeah. In fact, we spent a whole day just going out and measuring ley lines with different instruments. We wrote a paper about it. We know that's true. But the sound component, I think people, and you and I were both mentioning that, Evan, we mentioned before, that goes with all the sites. You see, that's the important part of this, that these sacred objects, the sacred instruments, the Tibetans and the original people keep that sort of didgeridoo, the drone instrument with one note, they go deep. And I think what their job is to resonate with these ancient objects and places to bring them back. Well, right. yes, and, and it's the compo these, these sorts of rocks, the quartz in the rock uh, um, of these ancient stone sites is a conductive material. And this is what I'm yep. finding really fascinating. I think we're really getting to what it's about now, that yep. 
the didgeridoo and these drone instruments give out several frequencies. They they have a drone and then they mm. create different resonances. Now this is very similar to binaural beats, which are used to change consciousness. Yeah. And this is where it gets interesting with these ancient sites between 8 yeah. and 13 hertz. All the churches were built on them because they create a stillness uh -huh. and an ability to, to get into higher states of consciousness and higher states of awareness. And this is really where the priest class have always found these insights and knowledge. Exactly. So uh, th this is where I think where it's tying it all together. And of course, academia doesn't really want to hear that, which is why you're becoming increasingly unpopular by the sound of it with them, which is a good thing. Uh, you've been more than increasingly unpopular. A badge of honor. Paranoia out there, the other side of the equation. We've been told that too, yeah. Yeah, well, you're right, because this is part of that whole story. Look, um, I, we, uh, we mentioned mine. We won't talk about it now. I've actually seen this gentleman play the ditch where he's brought, and I've heard of stories where he's brought a whole audience basically collapsed in rhapsody, I suppose, from what he's played. And I've heard stories where he's actually been playing something and the spirit has come in and given him something new to play. Well, that's pretty tricky me trying to explain that to a scientist. They're not going to get it, that there's something going on inside a stick, which is what it is when someone breathes inside a stick. It can bring a whole group of people to tears or basically change a heartbeat or, or make someone feel better. And I think we mentioned to you someone was having a heart attack when Uncle Lewis played. And within the seconds of it taking place, her heart beat, beat, was starting to beat properly and the best it had in 10 years. Well, I go and tell that to a surgeon. They're going to look at me and say, what are you talking about? Well, the answer is we're actually talking about the truth, but they don't get it anymore. So that's what this is all about. These rocks... Like you said before with the crystals, I think these rocks serve a different purpose. I think because they're silicate, I think the ancients knew all this crap before, well before we did. There's knowledge inside here. There's knowledge on the standing stone site we're working on, and that's part of this story too. And I've got to remind you of something, if I can, that the second rock we've got, right, it comes from the site. And what I'd like to do, and I'm, I've got his handwritten notes, so I'm going to read directly from them. And this is another part of this big picture we're talking about, Mark. And I'm going to read the last thing you wrote about this particular site, that this rock we're talking about that's got the letter A, which he claims is the first letter of the original alphabet. He says this. He says, Their philosophy formulated the basis of all knowledge in the beginning, now, and to come. So what he was basically saying is on this particular site where we've picked up this rock is the knowledge of what we've had, what is now and what will become, all on these rocks. Now, that's a pretty heavy saying. It's a pretty hard thing to believe could be possible. But now you've got one in your hand and you're looking at one rock, which has just got the first letter, which is the letter A, and you look at the sides of this rock and then you look inside the rock. Could it be that these rocks and this particular site mm. is the most important site, not only in Australia but the world, but... We're starting to think that because not only did we find that, we now found another part of this language that Frederick Slater spoke about in 1939. We also found another rock, which is one of the most important rock in Slater's language. You see, Slater claimed that the original people, the very first language which began in Australia, was all spiritual. And there were 10 motifs, and they are the most important motifs. And those motifs, and I can't, I've actually got his paper in front of here with his description of what they mean, and I can't actually use the words, but I know what they actually look like. Now, what's fascinating is all of these motifs are a circle, and then it's got one ray, and that one represents the first or the beginning. Then it's got two rays to come out, which is air, breath, and wind, and then three, which is clouds across the sky. And it moves up to the most important, which is nine rays to come out of the top half of the circle, not the whole circle. And that represents the guide to truth. Now, this is what Clay, Slater claimed. We've now found a rock that was within five kilometres. We just saw it a couple of days ago, which has the nine rays on it. This is the most sacred of all the rocks. 
and it actually means the guide to truth. And it's got the nine rays sitting on one half of it. And what that actually tells us is, now that we've found the letter A, close to the place, and now we've found the symbol for the most important part of that language, we now know that that particular site, the Standing Stone site, with these two pieces of evidence, because that's where they both come from, is a very scary place for mainstream. Because not only, according to Slater, does it have a language of over 28,000 words, it's more sacred or more religious and more profound than anything we've ever written since. And it talks about, and this is the scary part of this story, Mark, it talks about continually, doesn't it, Evan? What's the three words? Is it came to earth? Came to earth. Came to earth. Yep. Came to earth. Time after time it says came to earth. It doesn't talk about we were here. It says that man came to earth with his seven senses fully developed. It came to earth through the clouds from a light that shines far off. It's constant. And it tells us our ancestry is in the skies. Now, what we now know is because we've now found all this evidence, what Slater was saying was actually right. And now we have to deal with the consequences of that. People have to go back. And we said before, Stonehenge is very important because it does a lot of things. But it doesn't mark out the first language ever spoken, and it doesn't let mark out a series of statements that are basically where we should be today and where we aren't, and how we should get there. And it doesn't mark out the beginning of religion, the beginning of language, the beginning of humanity starting to make contact with its ancestral, celestial ancestry. That's no, what it also, doesn't. Also, no. Stephen, it's quite important about Stonehenge. That a lot of people miss. It was it was completely rebuilt in 1954 into its present shape. Thank you. And this one we have the original map when it was before it was destroyed. Slater and his colleague marked out the original map and marked out where each rock went and gave us its meaning. That wasn't done with the other one, was it? Now this is what's very important that people have missed with this. We can put we can put this one back rock for rock, position for position, and we still have an elder. Don't we, Evan? Yeah. That knows the song of That's the stone that. arrangements and the song of the hand sign because they're part of this too. And we have most of the rocks because what happened was the gentleman that destroyed the site displowed the rocks. You understand what that means? They were either pushed into the ground right next to the mound or they're down on the ground, they're falling down the hill and we've got them all. Stephen, so this is, can I just, yeah. uh, I don't want to interrupt you, but just for the sake of the, of the listeners out there, with this, can you can you explain why the farmers have to plow all these ancient sites back in to the earth? Oh, I'm thinking a couple of your listeners might be cringing right now when they heard that. Hmm. Look, don't blame the farmer because the farmer we worked with a person. I met the person who did it. He's dead, bless his soul, because he wanted this fixed up before he passed on. He was obsessed by this because he knew how important it was, and he was a good Christian man. He had nothing to do with original people. He was asked to do this, and the reason was. The research that Slater was doing was getting all the front pages of the papers. It was getting all around the world. It was becoming a real issue. And they were tolerating talk about Egypt because Egypt was part of it. But this other stuff about the original people and someone coming from somewhere else was too much. Now, what happened was within the nine months of Rough Bolt, Slater, we've got all these handwritten notes. And you can see as you read them, don't trust the museum. Don't trust the government. Don't trust anyone. They're all turning on me. One of his favourite quotes is, I have shipped a sea of troubles. They're attacking him all over. So just before, very clever man, wasn't he, Evan? Yeah. He got his consistent to go out and measure the whole thing up. Within about two months after that, the war begins, the First World War, Second World War, the government comes knocking on the farmer's door and says, the place that you settled, that your great-great-grandfather settled in the 1880s, we're taking it back because we don't like what's on there. We are now going to confiscate your land. Now, you can imagine in the Second World War, if the government says we're confiscating your land, you're done for. And they told him, well, we'll be back in two days and we'll take the place off because of those rocks. So what happened was in the next morning, the father told his son, who was 15 at the time, go up to those rocks. Now, remember this, that the farmer had stopped the cattle walking on that site lest it disturb the rocks. The farmer had been out with them, helping them. He was actually for the site. 
But he had no choice because the government were going to come in a couple of days. And we've got it written in the, the actual correspondence. They were going to actually take the land off him. So what happened was the 15-year-old was told to bulldoze it. Guess what? Their land was safe and the government left them alone. And if it wasn't for the fact that we found Slater's letters, because every other piece of evidence of him was destroyed, we can't even find a picture of this man who was the president of the Australian Archaeological Society. You can't find a paper. You can't find a letter of him. They destroyed him in 1939. For all intents and purposes, we think he died in 46, didn't he, Evan? Something like that. We can't even tell because you can't find out. He was dead from 39 onwards because he'd gone too far with his scythe. And they've shut it up until now. But now that we're standing here with two sets of rocks that have come off there, they can't shut us up anymore. We have proof. And what we have to deal with is, as I said, is, oh, look, the quotes from this particular site, the stuff that was said there, each sentence is like basically a passage from a, a great scripture except they keep pointing to <laughs> coming from the skies. Yes. They just can't leave alone that theme. You see, you've got to remember, ladies and gentlemen, by army, he came from above. He's the creator god in a spaceship, landed here and then went back up into the skies. His wife was called Mula Mula, and it says in their writings, the original writings, she was not born of the earth. She was born from up there. The sun a Biami, was called the Nameless One. And he didn't, came to the earth, couldn't stand the place, so he got back in a tree that mingled with the star stars, and when it took off, there was a flame and smoke behind, and the southern cross is where he went to. This is in their dreaming stories. The thing about them having an ancestry, uh, and a Pleiadian ancestry, they're very specific about this, is part of their ancestry, and it's part of what they believe. But now we've got Slater who is one of theirs, he's a defector because he was the president of their mob that has said the same thing. And, of course, they destroyed his notes, but we've got them. Now we've got his evidence back. So I don't know what they're going to do. Oh, I think I do, but yeah. we can hardly wait for that. But now we've actually proved this guy was right. Now the white fellas are saying, oh, you guys, you got it wrong. The original people were the first. They had the first philosophy, which is what he said, and their philosophy comes from somewhere else out there. That's what this story is about. It's very, very interesting because obviously the Crown has tried to keep this suppressed for a very long time in Australia. Look, there's no doubt. I can tell you now, um, these two rocks we've got, not so one, the new one that just turned up. We, as I said, you'll get this article today, Mark. It's actually, I think Evan hasn't finished sending it out. Um, these two rocks are a major issue. It's a fascinating, let me explain, let me share with you. There's two comments towards our name now, we've been told, from academia. They're either full of swear words and anger or discreet silence where they won't say a word and walk away. That's not what I've been, that's not what we think. It's what we've been told. I find it interesting that most of mainstream now won't even get angry. They want to walk away. What they're doing is what the ostrich does when it's attacked by the lion. They actually run and stick their head in the sand and hope that the lion will go away. Well, this so is the this, whole thing, isn't it? And and it really backs up the. It says it in a nutshell that the human race must have been at some point genetically modified in some ways because uh, this this ability to avoid the truth at all costs seems to be inbuilt once people have gone through the system, and that to me is not natural. It isn't natural, as somebody said. It was in a comic a couple of days ago. We might be smarter, but we're not better than any other species. In fact, we're worse than most. So where did that come from? This ability not to see the truth. It's quite fascinating. It's quite sad because we intend to pursue this because we've had an academic who's been trying to put our name up on Wikipedia now and it's become an obsession with him, hasn't it, Evan? Yeah. And every time he puts it up within minutes, there's a group of people who's actually captured all their names who are there straight away to bring our names down and they're all highly connected, charters and counted and all sorts of people. It is, I mean, I hate to use that word that ends like piracy and I've tried <laughs> not to but you know, I tell you what sometimes you keep wondering um, our website's getting smashed constantly Evans having trouble putting anything out there we know they're doing it but it, it's got to the stage now where the way they engage in con in sort of argument with us is we'll, we'll argue with any of this mob we'll, we'll bring our rocks and all the information we've got they don't even want to talk to us they run and hide you can't do that for long mate 
we cannot continue. And when the truth is out there and we just got to keep getting it out there, you can't confront the truth by sticking your head in the sand and hoping the line will go away. Well, that's absolutely right. And, of course, Wikipedia is now known to be one of the biggest disinformation sites in the world. Quite shocking, isn't it? He's got become quite appalled because he was a regular contributor. He's one of the top, top academics in the country, but he'd been writing all the right stuff for them. He said, I cannot understand this. He said, I've never experienced this before. And I wrote back and said, get used to the real world. And that's what he's found out. He's now telling me for the first time ever, he doesn't trust Wikipedia. They completely undermined what Lloyd Pye did. And his research was extremely good. His, extre his, his research on hominids and intervention theory. Mm. Whether you mm. agree with the Zachariah Sitchin aspect or not, his premise in Everything You Know Is Wrong was extremely well researched. And yeah. when he got involved with this star child skull, of which a very similar one was found by Brian Forster, a huge controversy erupted around that as well. So really, I don't think these people are doing themselves much good because it seems to be that we're creating a kind of exclusive priest class that's getting attacked by these academics, you know. It's almost like going back to ancient times. What we'll do now is just take another short break and we'll see you in a couple of minutes. We have in the studio David Compan, NHS electrician just released after being sectioned under the Mental Health Act. If you weren't with anybody, you'd have just disappeared. Nobody yes. would know where you are and you can be detained indefinitely. That's right. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for all your support. Thank you very much. Thanks, David. Our next guest, Nazrin, was evicted from her own property. This was due to a management company issuing charges which she disputed. A lady called for assistance from the police and she's now been arrested, handcuffed, took out of her own home. The student loans, the debt book has been sold. All of what we've yeah. talked about is coming your way. Oh Sergeant, have a seat. No, no, she's going to turn going to a police station at this time. What has she been arrested for? Well, that video was very shocking because Nazrin was actually peacefully occupying her own property and she was arrested for breach of the peace in her own house. It's very painful to watch because in that instance, I realised something terrible is happening in this country. We did a show about people getting their doors kicked in um, by the police on behalf of private interests without proper court warrants and this is actual fact, this is happening. It's illegal and it's corrupt and you have to ask yourself why the people who are willing to bust in people's doors, what the hell happened to them? You actually called me after they were smashing the door. Yeah. We actually got a phone call into their press office and first of all they said the police would never do that however they've been caught on video doing just that and um, the second time we called they said if the police did that it would be criminal damage so you've just witnessed cr criminal damage by the police Stephen and Evan Strong welcome back to Windows on the World Hi Dan right. <laughs> Very interesting so far and now we're going to talk about something that I think both you guys and I are extremely sceptical about, the oh, Crystal yeah. Skull. The Crystal Skull, and of course, we know all about the legends. A lot of these Crystal Skulls, they seem to have been made in the early part of the century uh, in a particular place in Germany, I believe. Yep. That, that, yeah, okay. um, that, 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 yeah. Yes, mm. that, that's, that was specialist in producing... Uh, the, this this kind of crystal and and really working it. So you found, are and I think you're in possession of, or have had access to, a crystal skull in Australia. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. Look, this this lady contacted us and told us, and I said, oh, I don't need this. Look, we're doing fine at the moment. We've got a lot of good stuff. We don't need the crystal area. I've taken no interest in it. I don't care because I didn't think it had anything to do with Australia. When I was told about that, the problem was, and here's my problem, and it's always been a problem for us, we met this lady through Klaus Duna, right? Now, you know Klaus, and we know Klaus too. Klaus is really into science and really into being very careful about who he associates with. 
He certainly so, is. Yeah, now, so when we, we first were going to make a contact, we didn't. And I thought, oh, look, I'm going to give this up. I don't care. I'm not. We had to drive five hours in, inland. You know, it was a long way for me, and five hours back, and we did it in a day, didn't we? Yeah. Pain in the neck, you know, didn't want to do it. And then the second time around, we found we could go. I thought, oh, God, crystal scud. You know what I thought I was going to see? And we spoke about this. We're going to see some cloudy quartz, right? And if you hold it in an angle at one light and hold it up to sunlight, you see a bit of an eye and a tooth sticking out, right? This is what we thought we were going to see. Taken no interest in it, didn't care. But I got a problem. I got a big problem. And the problem is this that all these other stories about crystal skulls has always been my own issue. As an archaeologist, and, and we are very careful with our science, I've never seen it found on site. They don't do archaeology. They say, I found it somewhere. Oh, really, where? I found it there. Prove it. Well, trust me. That's what it comes down to, doesn't it? Yes. In every case, it comes down to, I found it there where? Oh, I did. Well, if you've got a film, did you have four people with you who got stat decks that said we found it there? Better still, did you photograph it? Even better still. Did you film coming into the site, taking the object off site and walking away? Now, if you had that, you'd be interested, wouldn't you, Mark? Oh, you certainly would because well, it would then, the it would then give at least, give yeah. at least something to, to begin to with. Anchor yeah, I mean, look, it with. Yeah. Yeah, you got a base point because at the moment all the other ones could have come from Germany. This is, we knew nothing about that except that we knew it had been proved, disproven. And wherefore, when you cast shadow on one thing, you cast shadow on the lot. So okay, here's the difference. This lady says, "But look, I said the same thing. Oh, look, please." I basically said, "Thanks very much." And this Klaus, says, but she told me this. She said, "But we've got something no one else has got." I said, "What's that?" We've got film of us walking towards the site, going to the site. I know the site very well, by the way. I'm not going to say where it is. And we've got film of us taking it off the site, our reactions there, and what we said about that and bringing it away. Oh, I said, okay. So we decided we would go the second time and have a look, simply because that changes that crystal from any other crystal. I don't care what they look like. Even if I can see three teeth and two eyes, it's a bit better start than the rest because the rest can't get past the step one. The step one is... Give me archaeological integrity. You can't do it. If they've got film, which they have, and I can see their faces when they picked it up, and I can see that artifact being picked out of that site, then I'm interested. So we go there, don't we? Yes. And we talked for a while, for about 20 minutes, and we talked about general stuff. They seem good people. I um, kept thinking, you know, they're fakes. They seem like nice people. And that's part of the story. You've got to suss these people out. We've met a lot that are. Then she brings out the cloth, and we're thinking, yeah, here it is, and she pulls it out. Well, I've only been speechless twice in my life, and that was one of them. I didn't know what to say, mate, because I've got to tell you, if this was done in Germany, this guy must have been really on his, on his game for this one because this is stunning. It's got the suture marks of the cranium. You know how the, the cranium is not fully formed when we're born and there's a bit at the top and it fuses over? You've yes. got little rip marks around there. Well, it's got all of these marked out. Secondly, I've checked since then. Yes, the other skulls have got the teeth marked out. They've got marks down, but they don't have the bits at the bottom marked out so I can pick out which one is in size tooth and which one's the, the tooth at the back. It was so detailed, I thought, this looks a bit different. Now, the second thing that made me wonder a lot was, you know the story about they've got all this wisdom inside and it says things? Well, this one was all sealed up. Every crack was sealed up. They were sealed up with glue and there was crystals inside them green crystal inside one. I said, what have you done that for? She said, I can't speak, I can't sleep. He goes, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, gives me information, it's all good, but I can't sleep, it's going to kill me. So I seal it up. And what it happens now is it can give me information for two hours a day and when something's important. For those two hours, I just put it aside and it gives me that information. And then she says to me, you've got to put this information out so it only goes through our website, you can't link it through anyone else. And we offered someone who could put out film of this in 50 million, 50 million hits inside a week. She said, no, it can only come through there. You cannot get out information, who we are, where we come from. We want no notoriety and we want nothing. I'm thinking, if they're faking. And then, here's the interesting part. She then finally gives Evan permission to take photographs of it. And when he starts to take the photograph, the gentleman alongside stands up with his fish clenched and goes to grab Evan for taking the photograph. And she says, no, it's okay. He's allowed to take photographs just for, what was it, Evan? Uh, personal use. Personal use only. So all these things don't fit in with the story of someone who's trying to con us, right? Because they, you've got to gain something from it. They want nothing. And when we tried to actually put publicity out, 
Why didn't you jump up like a reflex reaction? Like if you hit someone in the knee, your knee moves, right? Same thing. And I watched his face and he was angry. And then he calmed down. We had to beg for permission to put the four pictures we got onto the actual thing. I had to ask later for that. That doesn't fit. The it skull. certainly doesn't because, as we know, the the skulls which have been proven to be hoaxes, the yeah, people who presented braided. them have presented themselves like Indiana Jones with big hats yeah. and big yeah. stories, you yeah. know. Now, there's more, mate. Secondly, this, I counted this. There were 28 teeth, not 32, right? We got 32. The incisors aren't there. Is this a child? It's either a child, but if you look at the eye sockets... If it's a child, our eye socket, if you feel where your eye socket is and you run your finger across, it runs towards the top of your nose. These eye sockets run towards the bottom of your nose. They're way big. And it, if it's proportionate, it's four foot high. So what we've got is the skull. of, the, And it's the most, I could see my fingerprint on the other side of it. It's perfect. You could see straight through. It's the clearest crystal I've ever seen. And it's as smooth as a baby's bottom. All this stuff, I'm looking and I think, gee, this is pretty good fake work here, guys. You really are gone to it. I'm still trying to be fake about this. I'm just still trying to find ways around this. When I see this woman, this guy react like things, I think, you're defending a fake skull like this. I, your job is to get it out. So we've got all those things about there. Now, people have since rung me up, people against these people. And I'm thinking, great, okay, you got to tell me it's the fake. Great, I can dump the damn thing. No. They're against it for different reasons, but they're absolute about the fact that it's supposed to be important. I've told story. I'm told stories at, at having monumental influence on the welfare of humanity. Now, I'm going to be honest. I'm not a skull devotee, nor are you. I'm, I'm deliberately not reading anything about skulls at all. Okay, I'm going to keep right away from that crap. I'm going to do this myself and go through this our way of doing it, aren't we? And we haven't read it. We're not looking up stuff. Mm. What we do know is I can read people pretty well. And whatever these people were doing, I can tell you what they weren't doing it for. It's not for money. It's not for fame. They, they were told it can only be released through us because the skull made that clear. It was to be released through us. So, okay, we do that. And they, we tried to load the articles we do on this on other websites. Not allowed to, are we, Evan? No. It can only be loaded on our website alone. That's it. Nowhere else. So we really can't spread the article that much. I know we send it to you. And if you guys spread it out, fine, but we can't. So we're bound to those rules. None of that fits for someone who wants to get any gain from their ego or their wallet. And secondly, that skull... I keep my curtains right down on this sort of stuff. I deliberately do so. When we left, there was a piece of skull that they couldn't work out how it was left behind. It was left behind and it was right next to me. So it's actually in our house now. I got a strong feeling that skull. The reason why she tapes it up is because it is too strong. I think there is something coming out of it. And I've got to, I mean, I'm not going to write it. But I really do feel like there might be something to this one. But we're still going to continue. I'm going to write this as a skeptic. I'm going to do another article. I'm, we're going back up to see this skull in two days, is it, Evan? Trust me, it is. We've, oh, okay. it. We've got a guy. We're going to film it. It's the first time ever we're going to be allowed to film it. I got permission to do, do that. And we're allowed to put it up on our website. Uh, and when we do our presentations only, she won't let us give it to anyone else. Again, this... You see, this sort of stuff behaviour is not going to fit in with the stories we've got of other people who've got it, where they're trooping around the countryside, they go around the world and they, they put on shows and people pay money to see it. They don't there's want to a, There's they only one, one other possible explanation, if you were going to be really cynical, and that would be oh, St Stephen and Evan Strong fooled in Crystal Skull hoax, you know, but you're very yeah, good yeah. at judging this stuff because you've been doing it for a long time. Mm. Well, that's the point of it, and that's why we're still trying to keep away from it. But um, we're going to go back up. We're going to film it again. We're going to try and look at it from every possible angle. But, uh, look, they've come to a lot of trouble to do this, and it's um, we've spoken to others who know about these people, and they all validate them as being what they are, and there's not a hole in the hole of this story. And because we're walking on eggshells because we've got so much good stuff, we don't want to be, be smashed by something that they can all jump on top of, of but... I've seen the damn thing, and I've held it for hours, and I've got to tell you, um, there might be something in all this crystal stuff. I mean, I know a lot of that stuff floating around is crap. We all know that. Uh, I'm going to keep it, as I said, I don't want to read. 
I'm just going to do it for myself and I'm going to keep that open all the time. And if I write that I'm fully convinced that it will be because I am fully convinced, I'm still sitting on, well, what are you on, 98% of it? Something like that. Yeah, about that. I'm still sitting on 98%. We're going up a couple of days. We're spending that time to do that. And we're getting another guy, the guy that was with us, that was obsessed by this. Um, he's flying. He's, he's just dropped everything. He's flying up from Sydney to our Brisbane to meet us there. And we're going inland about 5K, 5K hours. And we'll see what happens. But um, I'm going to try and a few things to see if we can find out a way of actually validating whether it is real. And we'll see if this lady is up to that. And then if I do that, I'll let you know how that turns out. That's absolutely fascinating, guys, because you've, you've got your healthy scepticism intact and your enthusiasm mm. is still there, which is why I always enjoy talking to you. Well, you've got to keep the avenues open, Mark, because the problem is we're dealing with stuff that I, I can't rely on mainstream. We, try, we always use mainstream science and rigour when we approach this and we write this up the same way. But when it comes to estimating and assessing this stuff, mainstream can't get it. They're not there because... There are aspects to this story that they'll never get. And what we've got to try and do is convince them it's real. That's the trick here. Now, this rock, well, these two rocks, and man, I don't know. I mean, the crystal skull, we're not ranking it in our top five because it's got that baggage, that baggage we've just been speaking about. It cannot get in front of some of this other stuff we've got because this other stuff is too strong. It's hard for them to fight against, it, and I know it's hurting them. And I don't want to take the pressure off with the stuff that's hurting when we've got more of it. And I don't want to give them an out clause. So I'm going to keep one step away, one degree of separation there. But um, I can tell you this. We've looked at pictures, and when you see the picture of this one, it's the best one. It's the best one. If it's a skull that's for the children, I don't know, because we do all know there's lots of children coming through now that have got eyes and, and a wisdom and a countenance about them that is like 500 Gandalfs in each, each occasion. So if they're around. And maybe this has got something to do with that. I don't know. But I can tell you this. The fact that I can count the 28 teeth and there's no wisdom teeth, the fact that I can see which one is in size of teeth, that's not on the others. The others aren't as, as artistically refined as this. The man who did this was an artist of, of sorts. But this, the sutures on, the, on the, the skull there and the fact that this lady has basically sealed it up to keep her sanity. You know, I didn't hear this story with the other ones. So we'll see how it runs and then we'll keep reporting in. But if I was a sceptic, which we are, if you're a realistic sceptic, you'd have to say a 90% chance there's something in this. And if it's worth a 90% chance, you'd be crazy not to keep looking, wouldn't you? Well, you've got to do, you know, sort of 75% research and go with your hunches with this stuff, as you know, because we're, we're not given any information. Um, most of the information we're given is wrong and disinformation. And... Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be great to actually find out that all these fake crystal skulls have been put out there to hide the real ones? I keep thinking that now. Never before, because I wasn't in a situation where I could actually say to myself, oh, hang on for a sec. I kept thinking, now I'm thinking exactly that, because what that has done is made everyone think, like us, oh, yeah, right. Throw it in my face first. Give me film of you walking up there taking that. Oh, I've got that. Well, that's what the only reason. If it wasn't for Klaus recommending these people, his recommendation I rate is very, very high. And the fact that these people said, yeah, we can prove that, I probably wouldn't have gone, even with Klaus's recommendation. So because we've been so burnt by what's happened with these fake ones. And as you said, this German guy was obviously paid to do this. And I think what he was doing was covering up from the ones that obviously – there's one that I think could be legitimate. Does that mean there's others? Well, you know, once you open the door, once you open the door and say, okay, I've got one rock, now we've got a second rock, now we found a third rock, when does that finish? The answer is it doesn't. Same thing with this crystal skull. We've got to get a tick with one. Well, I've got the pen in my hand, I've got the paper, and I've, I've half made the tick, and I'm just about ready to finish it off, but I need something more. I don't know what it is. But I'm going to need something else before I'm going to actually write in that page, on the paper there, I'm going to say, yeah, this is the one. I need something more than that. But as you said, it's stupid to go there with your eyes shut like most of this mob would. That's absolutely right. Well, it's very fascinating, that, and a great way to end this particular uh, <laughs> show that we've done together. And I always enjoy talking to you guys. I'm so glad we've caught up at last. 
Um, yeah, we met Proud, yeah. Yeah, well, I know you t you guys are becoming these modern-day Indiana Jones characters, you see, and um, and just think one day you might have your own computer game, Stephen and Evan Strong <laughs> and the Crystal Skulls, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that would be classic because one of the two people in that name is the card carrying lot out of Australia that won't touch a computer, won't even go near it, and swears at the damn thing, and that's me. Evan even has to hand me the mobile phone so I can talk to humanity. That would be very ironic. <laughs> I think that would be wonderful. <laughs> My role in this would be going around killing computers. And I'll back that one up. And shooting satellites out of the sky so you guys can't work with your computers, whereas Evan would be trying to repair them. I think we could do something there, Evan. Yep. Yeah, that sounds awesome. As long as there's a place in that computer game for a card-carrying ladder, I'd be in it. I think that would be <laughs> great. Well, thanks, guys. Uh, okay. As usual, absolutely fascinating stuff. And we'll speak to you very soon on Windows on the World. Beautiful. Thanks, mate. As always, we appreciate it. Okay, bye. Thanks for joining us on Windows on the World. Remember, keep watching those, watching us, watching Windows on the World. We'll see you soon.